gentlemen, if I could have your attention, please. Um, we'll, just, uh, we'll just crack on because uh, Nigel, unfortunately, is very kindly um, dived out of something else to come and do this. Um, good evening. Uh, welcome to the uh, San Fernando Scrutineering uh, Seminar. Uh, we've got a sort of extra special uh, uh, thing for you tonight because we're actually also, once Nigel's given his uh, presentation on Aquifera Boat and all the other essential things for preparation for an offshore Category 1 race, uh, we're very lucky this evening to have uh, Leon Chan and some of the crew from Tipsy Friends um, who were involved in the uh, offshore <coughs> incident in, on the Taiwan race in June last year which resulted in uh, people getting into life laughs and all sorts of other things going on. So some real, um, real time experience um, just to show how important preparing the boat is, not only in the boat preparation, but also the crew preparation in terms of training, be it sea survival, first aid, radio, or, or anything such thing. So I'd like to introduce Nigel Reeves. Nigel is, uh, is our sort of chief scrutineer. Uh, very often for the offshore races and will again be pre here near for uh, the San Fernando race. So over to Nigel. Thank you. Okay, thanks Alex. Well, good evening. Um, more pleasant. Last, last year when we did this we did it down on the dock. It was a bit cold that night so we're back inside. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about why we do the scrutineering, what we're trying to achieve with it. Um, and some of the things, we, I'm going to keep it fairly brief because I'm sure Leon's talks will be much more exciting, much more interesting. Um, and I'm sure most of you have heard my talk before. Right. The, the biggest reason to go through here is to make sure the boats are properly prepared for the conditions you might see. Um, I think we've been very fortunate in, in recent years that we haven't had any particularly windy offshore races. Um, certainly not bad weather. Um, elsewhere in the world they have, but we've been very fortunate we haven't. That's our primary aim, to make sure the boats are prepared for the conditions. And what we're looking for with scrutineering is that everyone on board um, is familiar with the safety equipment, knows where it's stored, knows how it works, and knows what to use in certain situations. It's no good just having one person on the boat who knows where everything is. They could be the person that falls over the side or is, is injured. You really need to get all your crew involved so everyone knows where it is. And the, the one thing I see time and again when we're speaking boats is you ask people for a piece of equipment and they have to go looking for it on the boat. Now, in a situation where you're actually really going to need that, you're probably not going to want to have, well, have the luxury of time to go actually looking for it. You need to know where it is. So plan where you're going to put your stuff. Look at the likely places where stuff can be easily accessed but kept secure and safe. And thirdly, when we're scrutinizing, we're looking to see that the boats actually comply with the, uh, the ISAF special offshore regs. Now, I know most people just look at the checklist. This is actually the, the special offshore regs. It runs to about 120 pages. Um, it's actually very useful. There's a lot of detail in there. So don't just look at the checklist. When you actually sign your safety and scrutinizing declaration, um, so I'm sure you will do this one. You're actually signing say you have read those uh, regulations and understood them. Um, there's a lot more than just this checklist in there. Now, part of the scrutiny process also is making sure that everyone's got their, their documentation so there is a paper trail so we can see everything's in place. And there are deadlines on this, and I would ask you all to, to observe them. We spend an enormous amount of time chasing up people for, for paperwork that's missing. It's very frustrating. Um, first one is the, the entry deadline, which is, what, four weeks away? Is that right, Alex? Now, on the same day, you need to put in your crew experience form. That's very important, because part of the, the process actually looking at the boats that are going is making sure that people have suitable experience. We don't want people to go out there with insufficient experience and run into problems. If the yacht club can see early enough who's on your crew list, if there's a, a shortfall experience, they can often help you perhaps find someone to come with you. Um, 
talk, talk to you in more detail about the actual people that's on there. But fill in those forms, and get them into Alex in the sailing office on time. <coughs> and also on that day um, is your free scrutineering checklist. This is the one, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. It doesn't change very much year on year. We only amend it for any amendments uh, in the ISAF Special Offshore Regs. Now, go through that. You need to get someone from one of the other competing boats who has done an offshore race, preferably someone with remote experience, to go through your boat with you. It will actually save you time in the long run, and certainly save the scrutineers time. The worst thing that you can do is get someone just to go ch -ch -ch -ch, tick everything off. That form goes into the office. The scrutineers, we look at the forms, we divide up who's going to do what boats. You actually get to the boat, you start going through it, and you find stuff that's been ticked isn't there, is out of date, and it's all it does is, is get the scrutineers back up and they start thinking, well, okay, what else is missing on the boat? It's, it's all for your benefit to make sure that your boats are safe. Um, also, the safety and compliance form, which is this one. This is the one I say you're signing, you actually read the rules, you understand them. That's very important as well. If that's not back for when we come to scrutineer you, we can't actually sign you off because this is actually the document that scrutineer signs to say the boat has been passed. Um, then later on, there's immigration and next of kin forms. That's much nearer the, the actual time you're going. Okay. Yeah. For this all to happen, I don't know, we're probably going to get something like 20 boats, Alex? I don't know what the well, estimation is. a bit more than that. Okay. Just in terms of this without paperwork, I don't mm -hmm. It's just that those are actually legal documents. And um, in the past, in other races around the world where there have been offshore incidents, uh, those documents have then subsequently been used in um, inquiries slash legal cases in court. Mm -hmm. So they are actually very important bits. Of <coughs> Hence the reason why we do ask them early and why we go to such lengths to get signatures signed and all sorts of things. Okay. This is the actual scrutineering process. So within the next four weeks, all you have entered, need to get someone from another boat to go through your boat, sign your paperwork and get it in. Now we're not looking for 100% compliance at that point. Um, we're looking for that closer to the race. But what we do want you is to go through the boat as if it was a scrutineering process and actually look, have I got the right number of flares? Are they in date? Is my first aid kit up to date? Does the manual meet the requirements of the ISAF Cat 1 route? Go through all that. It will take you time, probably probably a couple of hours if you do it properly with someone from another boat. It's no good just sitting there down on the chart table ticking everything. Because then when it comes to the scrutiny, he's going to take three or four hours to go through your boat and you'll find that if they find a few things, they start looking at everything. Uh, so do that in good time. That helps the scrutineers because then we can plan and then we've got a sort of two and a half weeks to actually scrutineer the boats. Um, obviously the bulk of that happens at weekends because most people are busy um, during the week. So we will give priority to boats that have got their forms in. Um, we will always contact those who've submitted their forms in good time and do those first because I don't see why they should be penalised over people who haven't uh, got their paperwork in on time. You'll be assigned a scrutineer. Um, I think for, for this year we've got Mike Westlake, Steve Corrigan, myself. You said you might do some. Um, you want to stand up? For those of you who don't know Cameron, Cameron's very new to Hong Kong but has got a really amount of experience offshore. Um, and Rob Berkeley and Kathy, yeah, Kathy Delaney. Um, so we've got a, a number of people who all have a reasonable amount of experience offshore and boat preparation. And any of those you can talk to <coughs> before your scrutineering. If you've got questions, come to me or come to any of those. Go and talk to Roger or Simon in the boat yard. Anyone there is going to be willing to help you. Our aim is to get as many boats on the start line as possible. We're not looking to fail boats, we're looking to get boats on the start line. But ones that are safe and ready to go offshore. Okay, 
a general checklist. Basically, we're looking to make sure everything functions properly, it's regularly checked, serviced and stowed properly. And the last thing, like I say, you want is you've got an inflatable device, you throw it over because unfortunately someone's falling in the water and it doesn't work. Get them serviced. You're probably running out of time almost now uh, to get things like that serviced. The service only takes a few days, but if they need parts, you might be struggling. Really, you should be starting this two or three months before the race. Um, one of the most common things we see is heavy items on the boat, not secured. Um, make sure there's fixings to hold batteries in place, um, stoves. Usually you find the tabs that hold the cookers in aren't bent over, so you can actually you got just grab the cooker, lift it up, and about 50% of them actually come off their, uh, their pivot. Um, tanks, anchors, all those sorts of things. There's lots of heavy stuff on there. It all needs to be secured. Um, strength of build, um, the ballast rig. This is all covered in the ISAF regs. Um, there's ISO standards, there's C certification um, that is laid down there that boats have to be built to. Uh, those of you are production boats, it's fairly straightforward, normally you get that um, from the manufacturer. Uh, custom boats, you're going to need letters from the designer and the builder to state what boat was built or designed to and that the, the build complied with that design rule. And you need to supply those to the sailing office. Um, IRC will take care of your, your stability numbers. Um, for HKPN, I'm, I'm not sure where people are getting them for HKPN, whether it's just from the design. Uh, you need to be able to, you need to have a, um, your, uh, sorry, approved um, no yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. <coughs> Common problems we see, and it's, it's amazing how many boats we see this on. <coughs> Lack of preparation. If your boat's properly prepared, the scrutineer should be able to go through it in about 45 minutes. You need to get everything laid out so that it's, it's ready to be inspected. Um, I'm actually encouraging scrutineers this year, if they get on the boat that's not ready, to walk away. Why should they give up three or four of their hours waiting for people to find everything? You know, everyone that does this is a volunteer. Everyone's giving up their own time. Um, but make sure you've got stuff prepared. Look at the checklist. Lay things out. Have your life jackets out. The life jackets need to be signed by the person in charge. Um, so make sure that the signature on the life jacket is visible. That the light on the life jacket is visible. You have to have them inflated. If you actually lay them out and open them up, scrutiny can come along, count the number of life jackets you've got. You can see the specification there too, because that's laid out in the ISAF regs. You can check that they've been inspected and signed. You can see the lights in day. All that kind of stuff saves a huge amount of time for everyone. And it's a good exercise for, for people on the boat, for owners, skippers, to actually go through and examine stuff. Make sure you've got your crew there. Again, the, the recommendation is a minimum of 30%. Um, I would say aim to get 100% if you can. It's far better to have everyone there look at the safety. <coughs> the last thing you'll do is they turn up on the day of the race and they don't know where anything is. A, it's going to make your race harder because you can't get people to go down and find stuff for you, get them involved in the preparation of the boat so they know it. I'm sure Leon will probably... He's, he's ran out of way. I'm sure he'll touch on this in terms of when, when stuff gets tough, what happens. Um, one of the typical things, emergency tiller. Any boat that's got wheels or doesn't have an unbreakable metal tiller has to have one of these. It's highly likely you've never used it. Um, they're often metal, aluminium casting, going into a metal fitting, it fizzes, doesn't fit. Make sure it fits before the scrutineering day. It's too late when the scrutineer's there to find out it doesn't fit and you need a hammer to put it in. <clears throat> Again, the heavy items. Go through your boat, look at where your batteries are stored, look at your gas bottle, make sure that if you actually grab it, because all the scrutineer's going to do is pick it up, and if it moves, it's not secured. Make sure it's there. Look at things like cockpit lockers. Is there actually a way to keep them closed? Because if you're putting stuff in there, if the boat rolls around, 
they can come out. Particularly the ones with the little push latch, you push in to lift up, you really need to put a pin through them so they can't be accidentally opened. Um, safety equipment storage chart, this is a requirement, but it's also a very good exercise. Look at your boat, think about where to put things, things that are easily accessible. I would say stuff like storm sails and things like that, it's fine to put those under bunks, because the chances are, when you're going to go for the storm sails, it's going to be everyone on deck. Same with things like a drogue, that can be stored under a bunk, because in the conditions where you want to get that up, people aren't going to be in the bunks. So, that. But things like, where's the first aid kit? Where's the uh, tools to cut the rig away? Things that you might need very quickly. You don't want to have to get people out of a bunk to get under the bunk for. Um, I touched on it earlier. Missing life jackets. This is another thing we often see. People say, oh, my, I've got crew coming in, they're bringing their own life jackets. We need to see those. They need to be um, serviced. Um, we don't do it here yet. I know in Australia, you actually have to have a service certificate from the manufacturer or their licensed service agent. Here, um, we just go along with the ISAF requirement, which basically says the person in charge must inspect manually. Now, what I would recommend you do before the race, get all your life jackets, blow them up, leave them for a day or two, make sure they don't go down. Have a look at them, make sure the webbing's not frayed, make sure they've got the boat name on them, make sure the whistle, the lights are all there. If you're buying new life jackets, the standard has changed slightly from this year, they now have to be supplied with a light and a spray hood. Um, ones bought previously, they're still fine to use, but they didn't have to meet that standard. And the life jackets actually have to be signed or initialed by the person in charge. You need a record to show that you have done this. Just on, on average, every sea survival course that we do when it comes to the pool session, I think well, on average at least there are sometimes two to three or sometimes more life jackets that fail when we get to the pool drill. So, you know, it's not the time to suddenly find we actually did the wheel that doesn't work. So this is actually just to give you some indication of really how important it is. I mean, you need to particularly the, the automatic ones. Almost invariably, the, uh, the activation system has an expiry date on it. Make sure they're still in date. Make sure the cylinders are screwed up properly, not too badly corroded. Most of them also have a little safety clip on to prevent accidental firing. Make sure they're there. And when you pack them up, make sure that they're packed up properly so that the, um, the firing mechanism is accessible. So if it's a toggle that you pull, make sure it's in the right place and you can get to it. I make sure they've sorry, got... Can I just add something on the corrosion on the cylinders? Uh, we're a service agent for one manufacturer. Um, the standard is if the, the cylinder's corroded and has done a colour transfer to the jacket, the jacket's condemned. You've already abraded the jacket. Right. So any corrosion on the cylinder is an issue, actually. Mm. Not, it's not too much. It condemns the jacket. Just one more thing as well. Carry some spares. Yeah. Uh, during the race, we need to battle the four decks on white four, and we're wearing one, and it gets damaged. Mm. Yeah, so. Also, even the fact ca carry some spare cylinders, and that because they're very small, very light, easy to pack away. If someone's life jacket goes off, in effect, if you haven't got any spare cylinders, they've got to sail with it inflated for the rest of the race. And believe me, an inflated <laughs> life jacket is not easy to sail in. <laughs> okay. Check your flares. Make sure they're, they're still in date. You've probably still got time to order new ones. I think you supply flares, the ship shop can get them. There's various people in Hong Kong can get them. But it's really too late when the scrutineer turns up two weeks before the race and says, they expired last year. I wouldn't say throw them away. Keep the most recent ones. Put them in the grab bag or whatever. Make those the first ones you use. If they don't go off, you get the in-date ones. But make sure you do have a full set of flares that are in-date. <coughs> Um, this has been something that's been coming up more and more recently, poorly prepared first aid kits. The ISAF requirement basically says, in the absence of a national authority's recommendation, that you use the IMO uh, ship's <coughs> medical guide, which runs to about 440 pages. Um, and 
has to be 25 pages of medicines and things to, to carry. Um, probably slightly excessive for what we do. Um, but in Hong Kong for a number of years, uh, Lucy Clark has made very good first aid kits. Um, they are really tailored to offshore racing. Um, and they carry fast melt if you're need antibiotics, painkillers, um, C6 tablets, anti-inflammatory creams and stuff like that. But what you need to do, whatever first aid manual you're carrying, you need to look in it. Almost certainly it's got a recommended drug list. So you need to make sure your first aid kit <coughs> contains what your first aid manual recommends. Okay? Because that's what you're going to be using. And in the unlikely event that you have to get help from off the boat, you can open your book up, you can see a list of what you've got, and you can talk to, M to a doctor by your MRCC or whatever, or on a ship or something, you say, this is what I've got. So you know what drugs you've got and what you can use to treat people. But again, make sure they're in date, go through them. What I would suggest is a very good way to do it. Make a little list of all your drugs, write down the expiry date beside them, keep that in the first aid kit. When you come to your next offshore race, you can pull that out and go, oh, and now I've got to replace certain things. It's easy, you can go down to the pharmacy in central or whatever, here's a list of what I need, and go and get them. You're lucky in Hong Kong, most drugs are readily available. Just on that Almost note, I get this a lot to the selling office, antibiotic, one set of antibiotics, i.e. one box of pills, will not cover all ailments. There are different antibiotics for gastrointestinal, there are different antibiotics for, for chest or or sinus infections and other such nasty things as well. So, you know, again, we are seeing this a lot. Is that I do actually have a list um, which I can give to boats that are doing it. It's not for general circulation for obvious reasons because there are obviously restricted drugs on it. But uh, okay, if anyone needs to, uh, I'm guessing that's probably yes. that one. Yeah, yeah. Um, like I said, the, the first aid kits, I'd say probably 60% of the boats, if not more, have them. And they are, they're very good, they're well presented, they come in a nice, robust, solid container, um, and they're relatively easy to navigate your way through. And the seller actually tells you how to use it. Well, yeah, I mean, they do run very good first aid courses as well. No, when you buy a kit, you'll see it only in two hours. Yes, yeah. That's exactly what you say it is. Yes. It's also it's marinized, also yeah. on a wet deck, and stuff like that. It's all in proper waterproof containers, yeah. and that sort of stuff, so you can get it all out and put it back in the way. The other typical thing, I've never quite understood why the manufacturers don't put it on the standard, but life boys don't seem to come with reflective tape. Um, you can go and buy it in the ship shop, but the number of boats you see without reflective tape on life boys and life slings and no name written on them, they're very simple things. But check it before the scrutineer comes. And this is the sort of thing your peer to peer scrutineer should be picking up. Okay. No eyelets in your heavy weather jib or if you've got a furling jib a sock mechanism for putting it up. Um, you need to, the rules require you have a heavy weather jib, and if you use a head foil to hoist it, you have to have an alternative method for, for hoisting it. Now the standard way if you've got a tough luff is you have eyelets, so you can actually put a tie around and send it up. Very useful if you break the tough luff, um, and it does happen. Hainan race this year, we managed to trash a tough luff. Fortunately, we didn't have to put a jib up after that because it would have been quite interesting, but we wrapped a spinnaker quite tightly around it and actually crushed it. Um, so it wasn't much use afterwards. Uh, <laughs> we won't go there. Um, needless to say, it was so bad, one of the owners went up the rig to cut the kite away. Um, but yeah, those sort of things, they're there for a reason. That's it. Any questions? Um, we get a lot of people asking why we do the system with um, the peer inspection on boats, are you getting on a boat too? There's a two-step process for that, um, and that was something actually that we inherited from Boris and Racing Clubbers. Um, the fact is if you get somebody else quite often who's maybe if you're new to offshore racing or um, not so experienced to go through the boat with you, it is actually a learning process. In addition to that, things like life rafts and e-probes, as Simon will tell you as a service provider, 
Our batteries can't suddenly be replaced instantly, and life rafts do actually need to go off to the service agent in Hong Kong, and they may not be able to service it in a week before the race or whatever. So the reason we ask you to do it early and get the stuff all in early is actually to help you. It's not because we're being lazy. It's actually to assist you in the process. So there are any um, things which pop up, and they do, despite even the most well-organized boats, things break, or, or who knows why, the boat governments have a go, and you're not on the boat, and suddenly something's not up to speed. So give us and you time to actually to do that. Um, particularly as well with the Easter race, the Chinese New Year, and it shuts down for 10 days. So that's again another example of why, why we do it that way. We do get a lot of people asking why it seems a waste of time in fact it isn't. Yeah, but definitely do your peer-to-peer -peer scrutineering. Get someone to go through your boat thoroughly. It will pay dividends really well. Okay. Any Leo two hundred one three one for offshore? Um, no, because the the, up, the special offshore regs uh, were two thousand twelve, two thousand and thirteen. Yeah. They run to the end of this year. Yeah, they run to the end of this year. Okay. You mentioned one hundred twenty pages. Uh, this is the all categories, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. Um, so, so but if you have a hack at one, is only something like 20 something. 30, zero, zero, three, yeah. zero, three, yeah. five. Okay. So, yeah. Do you actually look the way the design does it? Yeah. The, the index on the right hand, the yeah, basically, you look down here and, tells, and it tells yeah. you what it applies to. Um, but you'll actually find, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you do Cat 3 races to Macau and things like that. The actual equipment required to step from Cat 3 to Cat 1 isn't huge. Um, okay. We require sat phones and SSDs. It's expensive. <laughs> <laughs> How much did the boat cost? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it was a birthday gift, sorry. <laughs> uh, but, but a lot of stuff, your, your storm sails, your heavy weather jib, all these are required for Cat 3. Um, okay, there's communication equipment, sat phones and SSBs, which aren't required for Cat 3. They're not even required for Cat 1. That's a notice of race by where we, we're sailing. Um, uh, but the big thing is, Crew training, safety at sea, and first aid. That's the yeah. big step up Very to go from Cat 3 to Cat 1. But a lot of the basic stuff, making sure you've got um, softwood plugs by your through hole fittings, making sure you've got something, a method for cutting the rig away, spare VHF antennas, all stuff like that is actually required for Cat 3. I'm not sure how many of boats that do the Cat 3 races would actually fully comply with Cat 3, but that's the situation. It's not a huge when, okay, life rafts and communication equipment, that's really the big step from Cat 3 to Cat 1. Tricep. Tricep. Yeah. It's a boat boss that's rig at China Cup, we shouldn't have the ability to cut the rig away, which we had to do. Mm. Eventually had to knock the pins out. But, but a lot of people believe Cat 3 races would require a rig. Mm. Tricep anyway, because they're in a rig from Mesa. Uh, you have to have a race boat. Yeah, yeah race you have to have yeah. either or. Yeah, the tricep are great for deliveries. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Sure. Just you just mentioned uh, first aid. Is, uh, do we have any news uh, for, for, for courses? Uh, yes, yes, we do. I was just about to, to mention that. The only thing we want for uh, Nigel goes is that obviously this is a rule a rule race, a run under rule prescriptions. So a few are additional things. These are posted on the website, and these are addition to the Cat One race because this rule, rule, rule race is sanctioned by the Royal Ocean Racing Club and is actually in their um, stable of races. Uh, for this year, um, and those are posted on the website. Most of it actually yeah, is mostly recommendations. recommendations about things like wearing life jackets and yeah. stuff like that. But there's also one at the bottom is um, carries a pocket a pocket combination torch or stroke. Yeah, look at any any. Um, yeah, um, and there's one there's one other requirement as well, which yeah. is a searchlight powered from the ship's batteries, yeah. which doesn't mean a searchlight which can be charged from the ship's batteries. Or if it can be charged, but can run while it's charging. So the yeah, boat torch should be carried away for immediate supply. use in the event of a man overboard and night, and unfortunately for But that's something we've, we've, we've actually written into our yeah, previous one, because we need it for half the races, so we'll put it into the other races as well now. Yeah. Um, but if you look at any experienced offshore racer, well, all of them will carry an additional stroke on their person, as well as a knife. Okay, uh, now I just got to shoot yep, off, so thanks very much for that. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, those of you who will uh, be seeing who are persons in charge will be seeing a lot more of him in the coming weeks to come. So. Um, now